Welcome to the art lecture for week five. Today's um, esteemed guest speaker is Greg Horowitz, and we have a student from the artwork program, J.R. Rothfuss, who's going to give the introduction for us. So, J.R. Thanks, Shaw. Um, hello and welcome. My name is, as Shaw said, J.R. Rothfuss. Um, I'm a student in the artwork program with Shaw Osha, Kathleen Amen, and Julia Zay. And it's my honor today to introduce Greg M. Horowitz, who's here with us from Pratt Institute in New York. Um, I got to spend a good bit of time with Greg yesterday when he sat um, for a special critique with some of us from the artwork program. And um, he was able to come in cold and totally two-step with our far-flung ideas and questions um, with total aplomb and generosity. So that was really great. Um, Greg's own scholarship and writing revolves around aesthetics, the philosophy of art, political theory, psychoanalysis, and art history. He has a particular interest in avant-gardism as a site where critical theory intersects with art and political practice. He has written extensively on Kantian aesthetics, Hegel's end of art thesis, and the aesthetic ramifications of Freud's work around loss, repetition, and the uncanny, and the, unti and the timely manifestations of these in the works of contemporary artists ranging from Gerhard Richter to Paul McCarthy. Greg is the author of the books, The Wake of Art, Philosophy, Criticism, and the Ends of Taste, with Tom Hewn and Arthur Danto in 1998, and Sustaining Loss, Art and Mournful Life in 2001. His other published work includes the essays, The Homeopathic Image, or Trauma, Intimacy, and Poetry, A Late Adventure of the Feelings, Loss, Trauma, and the Limits of Psychoanalysis, and Robert Pippin's After the Beautiful, Hegel and the Philosophy of Pictorial Modernism. In 2008, he was the Berthold Leibinger Fellow at the American Academy in Berlin, and in 2010 came to Pratt Institute as Chair of the Social Science and Cultural Studies Department, and now serves as Professor of Philosophy. Before that, Greg taught for 17 years at Vanderbilt University, during which time he served as the dissertation advisor for our very own Kathleen Amen, commencing a years-long intellectual friendship, the fruits of which we get to enjoy in having Greg here with us today. On that note, please join me in welcoming to the Evergreen Art Lecture Series, Greg Horowitz. Thank you, JR. Let, let me just say that it's easy to join a two-step when you have such good um, dancing partners. So thank you for yesterday, too. Um, and um, thank you to Sean Kathleen for the invitation to come talk to you today. If you don't mind, I'm going to get down to work here. Um, So you see in front of you um, an image by the Italian artist, the late Italian artist Alighiero Boetti um, called Dementicare Il Tempo Perduto. It's a play on, um, this is, it means um, forgetting past time as opposed to remembering past time. And I'm gonna talk more about um, Boetti later in the paper, but just to give you a, a hint of what's coming, this is um, a ginormous pen drawing made with individual strokes. And you can see the title um, spelled out in code. You'll see the alphabet on the left side of the image. If you look at the apostrophes, you'll see in each of the panels, it spells out dimenticare il tempo perduto. I'll talk about another of these um, alphabet encoded <coughs> images later on. Um, but before we get to the art, we're going to look at something else first, <coughs> something everybody recognizes. And the paper is going to be, by the way, it'll be in three sections. I should talk about 50 or 52 minutes. So, but there'll be stuff to look at if, if um, my voice ends up boring you. The first section is called Everything. However small and humble, 
always has a beginning and stems from reality, which is a quote from Boetti. On March 8th of this year, London's Victoria and Albert Museum of Art and Design, the VNA for short, announced that it had added the pussy hat to its permanent collection. A funny word, pussy hat. Also perhaps a funny way for the VNA to put it, since as pussy hats play their signature role in mass protest, there is in principle no such thing as the pussy hat. As Karina Gardner, acting keeper of the VNA's design, architecture, and digital department, explained to Anna Russell, a reporter from the New Yorker magazine, the pussy hat is, quote, about collective action. It's about solidarity. Um, end of quote. Although the specialness of any particular pussy hat is irrelevant to why the museum is displaying it, this being the VNA, one of the world's top design collecting museums, they didn't want just any old pussy hat. With something like the pussy hat, Gardner said, there are hundreds of thousands of them. How do you know which one? This points to a nice fat contradiction between the logic of mass production and consumption, which is geared toward indifferent manyness, and the logic of collecting, which is oriented by the, the aura of the special and the unique. The VNA's solution was to acquire a pussy hat knitted by Janet Zweiman, which is the one you see here. Sorry, the one you see there. Um, one of the co-organizers of the pussy hat project. That solution, however, doesn't resolve the contradiction between multiplicity and collecting. It just evades it. Another face of this contradiction emerges if we ask, why does a pussy hat need to be in the VNA's permanent collection at all? Unlike Vermeer's, say, or Egyptian mummies, the world suffers no shortage of pussy hats. So what does putting one in a museum accomplish? Gardner explains of the museums, this is the name for the unit, the Rapid Response Collecting Project, which to my ears is uncanny because a rapid response unit is an emergency unit in a hospital. But the Rapid Response Collecting Project, whose task is to select for the VNA significant items from the current stream of design that, quote, she, this is what Gardner says, the items we collect are evidence of social, political, and economic change. And as a group, they form a permanent legacy of objects that help visitors and researchers make sense of the world we live in today. This modest pink hat is a material thing which, through its design, enables us to raise questions about our current political and social circumstance. Worn by thousands across the globe on January 21st, 2017, the pussy, has, pussy hat has become an immediately recognizable expression of female solidarity and symbol of the power of collective action. Close quote. There's a palpable tension here between two ideas that the pussy hat is an immediately recognizable expression of solidarity, which no doubt it is, and that it's evidence of social, political, and economic change. Evidence is what we collect, what we collect and what we present, when we need to build a case, prove a thesis, resolve a doubt, when in short we have before us an unsettled question. But since there is, by Gardner's own account, and she's right about this, no question of the current significance of the pussy hat. Any uncertainty must be coming at us from the future. The mission of the Rapid Response Collecting Project, then, is to preserve what's immediately meaningful to us in the present for a future when our moment of immediate recognition having itself become historical, it will perhaps become evidence about us. We ordinarily think of museums as preserving the past by collecting what has already stood the test of time. But with a pussy hat, the VNA is preserving the present, and I would even say gaming the test of time. The proper name for what the VNA is up to, in this case, is not just collecting, it's hoarding. The case of the VNA offers us a rich harvest of cognitive confusion because in this case, hoarding, which is a practice of never enoughness, and I will talk about it being a practice, a practice of never enoughness collides with collecting, which is a practice of exclusion and inclusion. 
The distinction between hoarding and collecting may it look at first glance to be merely a matter of degree. In fact, however, I think there are two very different ways of shoring up our fragments. Indeed, I would go further and say that not only are they different, they're contradictory in their aesthetic and ethical impulses and in their relationship to history. Collectors are judges who decide what belongs in their preserves and what doesn't. They withdraw selectively from the deposited fund of the past. Hoarders are also judges, but uncannily, or perhaps perversely, they save it all, which is to say that they judge without making discriminations and keep their eyes fixed firmly on the future. I, I realize, by the way, that's, um, it almost sounds like a, 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 a contradictory thing to say, that they judge without making discriminations. In some ways, that's the core of the, of the second half of the paper, trying to make sense of that. They judge without making discriminations and keep their eyes fixed firmly on the future. Whether you end up convinced of the accuracy and value of my distinction, we're going to have to wait and see. But I'd like to warn you right at the start that my goal today is to defend the hoarder against the more familiar and undeniably more reasonable logic of the collector. One more word of introduction. Although I'm interested in understanding the distinctive logic of hoarding, I'm also mindful that hoarding and collecting can often be difficult to tell apart just by looking, and that there are many cases beyond the V&A when amassing and selecting overlap. In the concluding section of today's presentation, I'm going to turn my attention to, the case, to a case where I think this happens fruitfully, and that's the work of the Italian artist Alighiero, Bo, Ebo, sorry, Alighiero Boetti, um, born in 1940, died in 1994. Boetti first came to attention as an affiliate of a movement in Italian art in the 60s and 70s that the critic and curator Germano, Germano Cellant called arte povera, um, or poor art, impoverished art. To underscore the use by arte povera artists of aesthetically impoverished everyday materials, wood, rocks, paper, rope, rags, as opposed to canonical materials, paint, marble, bronze, that had been shaped and enriched by their history in the making of fine art. I'll show you one other by uh, Marisa Mertz, called Living Sculpture. The impulse of Arte Povera was anti-elitist, aiming to break the link between art making and the elevated social status of art, along with the idealizing myth of the individual genius of the, art, of, of the artist that underwrites that status. But Boetti balked at the way even impoverished materials, suitably arranged in appropriate art world contexts, quickly severed their roots in everyday life, precisely because of the social status and individual genius of the fine artist. I'll now show you an image which is um, often considered the first instance of arte povera, although the name wasn't coined until several years later, which is Piero Manzoni's famous can of artist's shit, um, and, and um, suitably packaged for consumption in every international art market. It's in German, it's in Italian, so you can't make any mistake about what it is. Um, Manzoni meant this, of course, as an ironic jab at the status of the artist, even the artist's shit was valuable. One way of thinking about what Boetti balked at was the irony, right? It was a, it was a dead end irony. Um, I don't pretend to have worked through Boetti's many and diverse responses to the unconquerable Midas touch of the art world, and in any case, that would be way too much to try to undertake today. But my sense is that Boetti's effort to reconfigure the authority of art, that is to draw that authority from elsewhere than institutional or mythical sources, led him to push his practice into the realm of hoarding. I'll closely analyze only two pieces by Boetti today, but I'm encouraged to think I'm on the right path by some of the last works Boetti completed, 
complex, beautiful, and playful tapestries he called tutto, everything, right? And, and um, the, these are enormous tapestries. This one is um, 495, so it's like 24 feet by 16 feet. They're enormous. Um, in the Everything series, and he did, I think, 12 or 13 of them. In the Everything series, Boetti arranged images from magazines and advertising posters and alphabet stickers. If you look at this long enough, you'll see that every shape um, is the outline of a recognizable something. So he um, arranged images from magazines, advertising posters, alphabet stickers, whatever, as collages. The only formal requirement was that everything, however small and humble, fit into the quadrangle, um, fit into the quadro. There's a joke there in Italian, fit into the square. Quadro is also the Italian word for picture. So everything had to fit into the picture. Um, but these arrangements were not the final product. Boetti used them to create stencils, thereby abstracting the shapes from their source images and then sent the stencils to his co-workers, um, Afghani weavers with whom he'd been collaborating since the early 1970s, although by the time of the, of the Everything series, they were themselves living in Peshawar in Pakistan um, as refugees from the war in Afghanistan. He had been going back and forth to Afghanistan twice a year until the Soviet invasion. Um, Boetti's collaborators then wove the finished tapestries but the weave and color of the thread, what I think of as the interpretation of everything, was of their own choosing. He never sent instructions. He just sent the stencils and they went to work. Um, the weave and color of the thread was of their own choosing and just like that, everything becomes different. If everything really does fit into the picture, you'd think there could be only one picture called everything but you'd be surprised. Okay, section two of the paper is just called Hoarding. The literary scholar Elaine Showalter has referred to the last quarter of the 19th century as the golden age of hysteria. Over the course of 25 years, Showalter observes, hysteria went from being a rarely diagnosed condition with no agreed upon criteria to differentiate it from what was usually called just malingering, to the most common um, diagnosis in the psychiatric wards of Europe. In the same vein, we now live in the golden age of obsessive compulsive hoarding disorder, OCHD. The diagnost diagnostic category OCHD only entered the DSM the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is the periodically revised authoritative encyclopedia of mental and emotional diseases, only entered the DSM in 2013. After being controversially distinguished from OCD, Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, in the years between the publication of the DSM 4 R, DSM 4 revised in 2000, and the DSM 5 in 2013. Despite the fact that OCHD is a newly coined diagnostic category, really only agreed upon for the last four years, the American Psychiatric Association now estimates that between two and five percent of Americans suffer from OCHD to some degree. Please ponder that statistic for a second. Less than 20 years ago, there was no consensus among clinicians and research psychiatrists that OCHD, OCHD even existed. And now they judge that as many as 14 million cases of it are waiting to be diagnosed in the USA alone. Amazing statistic. As Showalter and others taught us to be skeptical about the explosive spread of hysteria, so too with OCHD, we're, we're within our rights to wonder if we're living through an epidemic of the disease or a viral overuse of the diagnostic category. I myself think it's in fact some of both. The golden age of OCHD is upon us because of interconnected transformations in individual and clinical ways 
of making and understanding meaning, and our broader relation to the world of commodities. More about this as we go along. At base, compulsive hoarding is a disorder of ownership. Many of us are familiar with OCHD from the many reality TV shows about it. The hoarders, inside hoarding, hoarding, buried alive. That OCHD, OCHD would become a popular television subject is, at least to me, not surprising. What is surprising is that it's not on HGTV, since those who suffer from it are mad interior decorators. They care more than most of us, I shouldn't speak for everyone, than most of us, about the appearance of their homes, and they tend that appearance with boundless energy and dedication. And while hoarding may look to non-hoarders like a plague of randomness, talking with hoarders always reveals that they have principles of cultivation. What makes hoarders unique, however, is not their strange way of making order, but rather their compulsion to display. One of the common practices of compulsive hoarders is to stack their possessions atop their dressers and chests while leaving the drawers empty. Perhaps then hoarders are less mad decorators than they are mad curators, driven to display all the pieces of their collection at once. I'll say more about the display rationality of OCHD below, but for now I want to underscore how the apparent disorder of the hoard rests on an extreme estimation, um, sorry, an extreme estimation of seeing. So extreme, in fact, that the value of their possessions becomes incompatible with storing them. Right here, there's going to be a distinction to be drawn between hoarders and collectors. The value of their possessions, seeing the value of their possessions, becomes incompatible with storing them. It's as if, mis as if hoarders misunderstand the idea of property. One owns property in virtue of a socio-legal compact that binds it to you regardless of whether you can see it or not. The compulsive hoarder, like the aristocrat and the child, doesn't trust this social abstraction. Hysteria, it has long been argued, was a theatrical disease in the sense that the hysteric performed her suffering through the presentation of her helpless body. The great neurologist Jean-Martin Charcot was thus not wrong, even if he was cruel, to turn the diagnosis of hysteria into a coup de théâtre, the moment of revelation, the moment the secret is shown. OCHD, by contrast, is a visual art disease in the sense that the compulsive hoarder's illness is witnessed in her visual creations. Indeed, the importance to OCHD of the presence of possessions near at hand, the arrangement of possessions near at hand, um, which is to say of their visibility, is expressed throughout the diagnostic criteria offered by the DSM-5 in terms of the inability to discard. And I, you see the inability to discard keeps appearing. I take the inability to discard to mean simply the inability to let anything escape the picture. Right? I won't read these through. You can um, look at them on your own. What distinguishes OCHD from obsessive compulsive disorder, that is from OCD, or at least this is the argument that those who defend the diagnostic specificity of OCHD say, is that the element of obsession is lacking in OCHD. Now, in the face of the ceaseless accumulating that we see in hoarding, this seems, of course, like a strange thing to say. Right? That certainly looks like obsessive behavior. But according to Randy Frost, one of the leading defenders of the diagnostic specificity of OCHD, and the main source, I should say, for a lot of what I'm going to be saying today, OCHD lacks the element of anxiety that's a defining feature of obsession. 
Episodes of OCD, which in the extreme can swallow up days and weeks of the sufferer's life, typically begin with an intrusive thought about contamination or, or injury or invasion. This intrusive thought sounds the alarm of imminent danger. To ward off the danger and silence the alarm, the sufferer is compelled to engage in rituals of avoidance, such as repeated hand washing or speaking a certain sequence of words a certain number of times in an exact order, rituals of avoidance. Um, the compulsive behavior, the C of OCD, is an anxious effort to banish anxiety. Note that nowhere in this cycle is there anything we would call a positive emotion. The best that can be hoped for is the relief of allaying the obsessive thought and returning to the status quo ante. Right? There's no positive emotion in this whole cycle. Now, there are some behaviors characteristic of, o uh, characteristic of OCD that are also found in OCHD. That's why it seems strange to distinguish them so sharply. For instance, inflexibility about what counts as norms of proper arrangement. But these are only surface similarities. Things are overall very different for hoarders. They feel compelled to buy or scavenge or save, but it's only inhibiting them from doing that that causes anxiety. If you prevent a hoarder from going to the mall or diving into the dumpster, or you force the hoarder um, to discard things, then they suffer. That's what's at stake at, in, DC, in the DSM-5's criteria B and C. Intervention in the hoarder's activities causes psychological distress. Giving in to the compulsion, however, is wholly gratifying. The key difference between obsessive compulsive disorder and hoarding disorder may be put this way, whereas sufferers, sufferers from OCD are obliged by a force beyond their reckoning not to give in to their impulses, sufferers from OCHD are obliged, compelled, to give in to theirs. People with OCD suffer from a compulsion to control their impulses, People with OCHD suffer from a compulsive lack of impulse control. OCHD is in this light a disease not of anxiety, but of pleasure. And by the way, this is the central reason given by some psychologists for, elim for li eliminating the O from OCHD, right? There are some, if you read the literature, some people just call it HORD, capital H, capital O, capital A, capital R, capital D because they want the O gone, the sense of obsession. Um, I would have done that myself. It's just that I need the word hoard as a verb and a noun for the talk, so O-C-H-D. What then is the connection in O-C-H-D between the compulsion that the mass must grow and the compulsion to display what is owned? An easy answer to this question would be to say that since every item in a hoarder's collection is a token of pleasure, of an impulse gratified, discarding any of them would lead to a feeling of loss. The hoard, from this point of view, would be a visual safeguard against the threat of desolation and mourning. But this interpretation, I think, can't be right as it stands. The relationship between an impulse call it an impulse, the relationship between a need, the object that satisfies it, and the feeling of gratification depends on the use of the object. But hoarders are no more able to use their hoard than to discard things from it. In fact, using things is, for hoarders, simply a way of discarding them, of making them disappear which is why they so often leave what they acquire on their shopping sprees protected in its original packaging. It's worth noting that the belief that using things destroys their value, rather than actualizing their value, is a belief that's shared by ordinary collectors too, who protect their collections of whatever it is, books or pottery, in display cases that visibly inhibit their handling. Um, using is nothing but a step on the way to using up which is always the enemy of the collector. 
Now, one of the more insalubrious kinds of collecting, and now I'm returning to OCHD, is hoarding food, even beyond the date when it's safe to eat. I'm not showing you any pictures of this. Um, patently, an abundance of uneaten and now inedible food is a hoard of what hasn't gratified a hunger. It represents not the memory of gratification, but of gratification foregone. This is paradoxical, of course, since it suggests that even if the hoard is the consequence of a lack of impulse control, its visible accumulation is testament to the restraint of impulse. It's a contradiction here. I think resolving this contradiction between lack of impulse control and resistance to, to gratifying use, resolving this contradiction is the key to understanding compulsive hoarding. I'll resolve it in detail below by following another thought of Frost's, who proposes that what hoarders hoard is not, despite what it looks like, stuff, but opportunities. Put in my own words, hoarders take pleasure neither in consumption nor in foregoing consumption, but in anticipating it. The hoard, in other words, displays the limitless future of desire. It is the promise of happiness. In this sense, the hoarder, amidst his or her displays, is a kind of esthete. Even if, as will seem strange to most people with refined tastes, the hoarder has no interest in any artistic form that will um, make vivid now, make vivid in the moment of immediate experience, the illusion of actual fulfillment. No interest in that at all. It's a kind of aestheticism without form. Okay. Now the avidity with which hoarders value accumulation over use might remind us of the behavior of misers who refuse to let anyone, themselves included, consume a share of what they own. Like misers, hoarders are zealots, and on some theories of OCHD, walling themselves in against other people and the needs of other people is a core ambition um, of, of hoarding activity. But unlike the miser, the hoarder is not typically selfish. While hoarders cannot without distress use, discard, or sell things from their mass, they're frequently very happy gift givers. Which I think by definition a miser is not, right? So they're frequently happy gift givers. Um, unlike misers then, they're not hostile to the circulation as such of their riches, but they are hostile to the wrong kind of circulation. Although I know of no empirical studies that support the inference I'm about to draw, hoarders seem able to make gifts of things they've withdrawn from the cycle of purchase, use, and gratification if they imagine it being kept withdrawn from that cycle by the recipient of the gift. Their solicitous concern for their stockpile leaves, rooms for, leaves room for others who, from their point of view, share that concern. Indeed, hoarders often add to their hoard, buy things, sorry, based on the belief, buy or collect, based on the belief that the item will be of interest to someone else, based, that is, on the perception of its gift value. This makes the hoarder not a miser, but when you think about it, a kind of altruist, albeit of a strange or perverted kind. For what the hoarder aims to serve is not the needs of other people, but the needs of the goods themselves, right? The needs of the stuff. And other people are served only when they're imaginatively drawn into the service of hoarding. Perhaps we shouldn't call this altruism then, since that concept commonly signifies direct regard for the interest of other people. But I'm not sure there is a common concept with which to name the virtue of generalized, unselfish, and impersonal regard for the promise of future happiness that's embodied in every single thing in the world. I don't think we have a name for this virtue. You might, when you see what hoarders do, think this can't be a virtue. 
that's all right too. But if it is a virtue, I don't know what to call it. We lack a way to understand that hoarders stockpile disinterestedly on behalf of us all. What they hoard is the future, and for this they pay the price of a maniacally selfless regard for disregard, sorry, for life unfolding in the moment. And I won't talk about these, but um, the top is a hoard of clocks by the artist Armand, and the bottom a hoard of watches um, put together by Boetti. And by the way, I'm not gonna talk about these now, but I will soon enough talk about why I changed the spelling of Boetti's name. Okay, added the E in the middle. The hoarder, I wanna say, is in the grip of a utopian picture of the world of goods as a hoard of unbroken or not yet broken promises. It may even be, oh right, just I should say one thing. The, the annual watches, it's like a joke about even a broken watch is right once a year, so he collected a watch for every year, so it would be right <laughs> in that year. Um, um, it, 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 so, um, the world of goods as a hoard of unbroken or not yet broken promises. It may even be that the hollowness of the promises, the fact that they're made to be broken, is sensed by sufferers from OCHD, for they seem not to be moved to test the promises. It isn't that they buy the hundredth set of bed sheets because the first 99 were scratchy or ill-fitting or in some way defective. Everything remains equally unused. No promise has ever been fulfilled, but at the same time, no disappointment has ever been experienced. In this way, compulsive hoarders seem less susceptible than most of us who buy things because we think it'll make us happy. They seem much less susceptible to believing in the promise of commodities. A weird thing to say, right, for someone, <laughs> for someone who buys endlessly. But they seem less susceptible to, to believing in the promises, and yet they continue to amass commodities. With this in mind, I think I can resolve the paradox of hoarding. Hoarders, in fact, the way I'm going to do it, for those of you who've studied Kant with Kathleen, I think of this as the antinomy of hoarding. Right? I think I can resolve the antinomy of hoarding. Um, hoarders cleave apart the two very different meanings embedded in the concept of the consumer. Consumer means, in one sense, a user. But in the sense that's more central to the economies of societies of mass production, a buyer, right? When you look at, at um, the Consumer Confidence Index, if you do, um, if you're really bored and you do, um, there's no concern with whether the things that are bought are used. What matters is whether they're bought, right? It's about the circulation of value, right? So there are two meanings packed into the idea of the consumer, the user and the buyer, and the hoarder cleaves these two meanings clean apart. Hoarders buy, but they don't use. Whether sufferers from OCHD are conscious of their ambivalence about the allure of commodities is something we will never glean from their oral testimony. If you read case studies, you're never gonna figure this one out just by listening. Because when called to account by non-hoarders for their habits, hoarders regularly acknowledge that their hoard is mostly useless to them. Right, they acknowledge this. They rarely try to translate their reasons for accumulating beyond reason into reasons that are intelligible to non-sufferers. They perceive value that they don't expect others to perceive, and they don't even try to convince them. The ambivalence between generally valid and shared reasons, and reasons and perceptions at work at a particularly problematic behavior, the ambivalence about them is common in psychopathology, right? On some views, this is what defines a psychopathology, is an unresolvable ambivalence. I'll conclude my discussion of compulsive hoarding by reflecting on how this ambivalence plays out. Now, one of the uncanniest aspects of compulsive hoarding is what theorists and therapists call churning. Um, if you have taste like mine, this is the fun part of the paper, so. Irene, who is 
um, Randy Frost's specimen patient in the book called Stuff, complains to him that she spends hours every day trying to clean out her house. The piles plainly never shrink, though, so Frost asks her to show him her sorting process. Picture this. Stacks cover every surface in the room. And keep in mind, as you do picture this, that Irene sees surfaces where those of us with more miserly metaphysics don't, like pans turned upside down, um, cushionless sofas, which are cushionless because the cushions themselves have already been turned into surfaces. She sees surfaces, places to store things. From atop one of the stacks, Irene picks up a piece of paper. It's a months old newspaper clipping about drug use among teenagers that she explains to Frost, who is her therapist, she means to give to her daughter. But her daughter's away at college at that moment, so Irene puts the clipping down atop a nearby stack. She explains to Frost that keeping it atop that stack will remind her to give it to her daughter when her daughter is home. Okay. Back to the first stack now. Where the newspaper clipping once was, Irene now finds exposed a promotional mailer from a phone company that she explains she saved because it promised her cheaper rates. But she hasn't had time yet to explore the opportunity, so she takes it and she puts it on top of the newspaper clipping. You can see where this is going. By the time Irene gets to the bottom of the stack she's working on, she's done nothing but invert it, top to bottom. Irene undertook the task with the express purpose of separating out the good stuff from the junk. In the end, though, everything was saved. What's most amazing about churning, to me, is not simply that the stated reason for doing it is defeated. This seems to me the common substance of human life. Right? It's not that the stated reason for doing it is defeated, but that what defeats it is precisely another process of reasoning. Irene makes a purpose of decision about everything she handles. But whatever her test of value, everything passes. Frost calls this a problem with decision making, which is rather an understatement. Um, it is, however, hardly a problem of indecisiveness. It's instead a problem, you might say, of too much decision making. Irene is nothing if she isn't a thinker. Indeed, Irene is a virtuo virtuoso at the intelligent perception of value to which others are blind. When she picks up a cap from a long lost pen, she churns it back into the hoard because it may be useful in the future as a piece in a board game. Frost finds himself forced into a kind of grudging admiration for her. He's, quote, the physical world of hoarders is different and much more expansive, he says, than for the rest of us. Now, Frost's way of putting this seems to me right, um, but it doesn't get to the heart of Irene's suffering. Um, it can't, since the expansiveness of her world just is the restriction of her life. It's two sides of the same phenomenon. Um, wherever, Irene turns, wherever Irene turns her eyes, things worth saving are in plain sight. The individual rational decision to save each thing expresses an undifferentiated, you might even say messianic love, to which Irene is bound. Everything deserves to be saved. To not discriminate the worthwhile from the contemptible, as non-hoarders do, is to experience a world that just exudes positive value all over the place. Quote from Frost, a mixture of what seemed to me both worthless and valuable things was to Irene a collection of equally valuable items. This, I think, is exactly right. Hoarders are radical egalitarians. It's not that they refuse to judge. They're not Stoics. It's not that they refuse to judge, but for them, every camel makes it through the eye of the needle. Compulsive hoarders are not wrong to be radical egalitarians. 
that pen cap would make a perfectly fine game piece, no worse at least than the thimble, boot, and wheelbarrow that Hasbro recently kicked out of the Monopoly set. Yet this egalitarian treasuring is also the source of suffering. Hoarders sacrifice their lives on the altar of the perception of universal value. To be unable to discriminate the dispensable from the indispensable is to be unable to live. It's the conflict between the hoarder and everything in the world. Everything in Boetti's sense. The conflict between the hoarder and everything in the world, between the perceiving self and the superabundance, the unending everythingness of the manufactured world that is on display in compulsive, boundless treasuring. And the hoarder for whom widely shared perceptions of disvalue provide no reason to stop treasuring is left to fight this war alone. Okay. Now, one more paragraph and then I'll turn to Boetti. Sometimes it falls to the sufferers of illness to show us all problems of a more general scope, even if or especially if that problem is not generally acknowledged. The cure for the hoarder is what you might call accession to a higher indifference, which is to say the acceptance of exile from the shining world in which everything is valuable in its own way. The active hoarder refuses to exceed. It's important that it's an ambivalence because the active hoarder recognizes that the hoard is useless, but refuses to accede to this judgment but the more general question, which I think has never been broached, sorry, that was an obnoxious thing to say, which has never been adequately broached, is how does anyone ever accept this exile? And yet, of course, most of us do, most of the time, and forget in the process that we're exiles when we do that. In Frost's words, quote, most of us live our lives categorically at least the part of our lives dealing with objects. Tools are kept in the toolbox, bills to be paid are kept in a special place in the office, and then filed after payment, kitchen utensils go in a drawer. But Irene organized her world visually and spatially, that is in terms of the appearance of value, the value that shined from everything, not by category, that is in terms of judgments of inclusion and exclusion. Life demands assent to the categorical, to the normative and shareable perception of where things properly go, to, in short, the overcoming of the messianic perception of value. It seems easy, doesn't it? This is valuable, that's not. This is useful, that's not. And what goes nowhere goes in the trash. The world certainly offers us ready-made offers us ready-made the categories we need to take out the trash. From the point of view of normal psychology, Irene needs to get organized. Really though, what she has to do first is learn to believe in the mess. Okay. Believing in the mess. Um, last part of the paper is called The Sixth Sense. My discussion of OCHD has, I hope, let us see how compulsive hoarding makes visible problems of human life that concern us all. Um, what cost do we bear for the development of the ability to see with the force of unreflective immediacy, just by opening our eyes, what has no value? What must we leave behind to ascend um, to the shared categorical world in which an abundance of values becomes trash? What was valuable now looks to us like junk. Um, is there any way to acknowledge and repair the injuries that we inflict when we learn to forget our history of devaluation? If the price of that is becoming an active hoarder, it's reasonable to think that's too high a price to pay, to repair. And what's the place of the messianic impulse in the world from which it's exiled? I think these are questions of general interest, not just um, psychopathological interest. I'll now take these questions up by turning to discuss Alighiero Boetti, for it is in art, I believe, that these questions are of necessity addressed. Near the end of my talk, I'll say something about why I believe this task falls to art. 
So let me begin with what might be the pens to which Irene's vagrant caps once belonged. From 1972 through the late 80s, Boetti made a series of monochromatic works, um, um, Dementicario Tempo Perduto is one of them, um, which he called generically um, Lavori Biro, in, in English meaning simply ballpoint pen works, since Biro is the generic name in most of Europe for mass-produced ballpoint pens. Here, we're looking at um, a ballpoint pen work from 1973 called Anonimo. The technique of this work is as simple as can be. I'm going to show you a, a small one from two years later, because you can see it a little better, I'm about to say. Take a pen, make a short vertical stroke, make short vertical strokes, each one of roughly the same length, left to right on the paper, leaving no space between strokes. Continue until the right ed edge is reached, then return to the left edge and start again. When the pen runs out of ink, continue the mark making with a new pen, right? And for me, there's great drama. If you look at this, you can see as the pen begins to run out of ink, right? When the pen runs out of ink, continue the mark making with another pen, and so on. Stop when, well, that's a good question. Stop when? Sometimes the answer is when there's no more paper to draw on. But that's not an answer that's internal to Boetti's practice, for there's no more aesthetic uh, significance to the individual, individual sheet of paper than to the individual pen, right? It's just everyday sheets of paper. In fact, what I want to say is there's no internal limit to these works at all, no authoritative stopping point at which one can say it's done. Back to the big one again. The end of one work is nothing but the opportunity to start another. Put otherwise, there is no principle of individuation within or between the drawings. It's not so much that they're serial works, one after another after another, as that they are one endless work, one way of working that contains within itself the possibility to go on and on and on. With no reason to stop, however, one might reasonably wonder if um, the Lavoie Bira, the, the ballpoint pen works, count as works of art at all. They lack any principle um, of completeness, of compositional adequacy, of formal unity. Indeed, were endlessness, by, another word for endlessness is pointlessness, right? Were, were endlessness the whole story, we might want to conclude that these are merely exercises or doodles what the anthropologist Claude Levi-Strauss, no fan of modern art, called what artists make when they're not making art. Yet the Lavori Biro offer more than the mere opportunity to go on. I have to believe what I'm about to say. They offer more than the mere opportunity to go on. They offer us a reason to go on. And although we have only a very old name for this reason, it seems to me it's there as plain as day. I think it's even visible in the um, image that you're seeing. Um, it's their unbelievable beauty. Beauty which I'm gonna argue is the product of no one. It, go, it goes without argument. I'm not gonna argue that they're beautiful. If you don't see it, there's nothing I can say. It goes without argument that the beauty of these works, if you see it, is not an effect of any of the individual pen marks, as no one of them stands out as decisive. It would be very strange to be standing in front of one of these and go, there's the one. If you remove that pen mark, it would be ugly. Right? Um, no one of them stands out as decisive. In any case, if the beauty were the effect of a decisive mark, that would be a reason not to continue, but to stop, right? Nailed it. I'm done. The beauty is an effect of the radi radically egalitarian accumulation of pen strokes of the whole mess of them. No more marks are necessary once the beauty is emerged because nothing in the drawings has autocratic authority. More marks are always welcome. Beauty is achieved, in other words, at the same moment that its promise is renewed. There's inexhaustible invitation and endless time to play. 
Now, every um, um, lavoro biro does end, of course. So much is dictated by the metaphysics of individual things. Things end. At some point, then, something, one more mark, one more mark, must be left out. But because the requirement to stop is not an internal aesthetic feature of these works, in other words, because you have to stop, doesn't mean that you're finished. It is, from the point of view of the working, an arbitrary command, sort of like the sun coming up after a night that you hoped would never end. To treat an as yet unmade mark as appropriately left out, as properly left out, would amount to a kind of scapegoating, as if it were the mark's fault that every sheet of paper happens to have an edge. It would be scapegoating. But if this conflict between ending and boundless beauty truly is inevitable, then we must conclude where there is beauty, there too there is injury. Yet it's the formal achievement of these pen works that the exclusions they perforce generate, of necessity generate, they don't treat as irrecuperable or irreversible. If to experience the beauty of a portion of one of the lavoro biro is to perceive a reason to make more of it later, then it's the experience of a call to repair arbitrary exclusion. It's an ethical impulse. The connection between this art practice and hoarding is, I think, perhaps already emerging. For the drawings are ways of valuing all mark making, but indiscriminately. Okay. I'm, I'm going to run over about five minutes. Is that all right? Okay. With this thought in mind, let me return to Anonimo, what you're looking at. I have to begin by noting, and this is going to sound like wordplay, but it matters, that there's no such word as anonimo in Italian. Um, Boetti's title is a portmanteau, a uh, condensation, like um, brunch, breakfast and lunch. Right? It's a portmanteau, a condensation of the Italian words anonimo with an A, which means anonymous, nameless, or as historians refer to works of art of unknown authorship without attribution. And homonimo, with the M and the N, with, with the, an M where the first N is, which means homonym, but also, what does homonym mean? A namesake, a person with the same name. Right, so it's a condensation of um, anonymous and homonymous. The English equivalent would be something like anonymous, I guess, um, which is a good reason not to translate it. Um, this semantic play expresses the strange thought that bearing a name, which is bestowed on us as neonates in recognition of our individuality within a family, also magically connects us to others outside the family who bear the same name. It's as if, um, um, my parents were asked the question, which Horowitz is that? Ah, it's the Greg one. Um, right. To have a name is to have someone else's name. To be you, and at the same time, a link in an anonymous chain. But when we think of it, I think this thought is not so much strange. This thought is very common, but also forgotten. I'm sure I'm not alone in remembering as a child meeting another child with the same name and finding this uncanny, right? As if there was some membership here. As if the homonymy revealed a mysterious doubling and an exciting, overstimulating intimacy. Now, this magic of names is made explicit, or if you don't mind, what we call magic when we make it explicit, religious in cultures that officially celebrate name days. Um, in Italian, onomastici, name days, when sharing a name with unknown others occasions a festival blessed by a name saint. Right? So it's not that this is unknown or uncommon, it's just somehow been covered over. Having your own name is an outcropping of social anonymity 
at the heart of the self. Having your own name is an outcropping of anonymity. Boetti made this dialectic explicit when in 1968, he split his own name in two. His born name is Alighiero Boetti. He renamed himself Alighiero A. Boetti, Alighiero and Boetti. That's his new name. Um, I confess that when I first encountered his art, I thought his name, I thought Alighiero Boetti referred to two individuals. Um, I couldn't have been more wrong, but not because his name signifies one individual. Alighiero e Boetti is the site of the conjunction of two ways of being called out of yourself, of being in society with unknown others. Unknown others, not just known others. With this thought in mind, I'm going to look closely at one of the Anonimo drawings. This one, the one you're looking at, comprises 11 pieces of paper, each 28 and 3 quarters inches by 40 and 3 eighths inches. I haven't done the exact math, but by rough calculation, there are 64,597 pen strokes here, give or take 10,000. Um, this heaping up of the same might lead one to judge Alighiero e Boetti, an obsessive artist like, say, Yayoi Kusama, who does the same thing over and over again with strange, sometimes comic indifference to context. But if I'm right that the beauty of Boetti's work is sheerly additive force, it's sheerly additive force, the more strokes, the more value, then this is not personal obsession, which it is in the case of Kusama, but the absence of any reason not to add another mark. Unlike Kusama, um, Boetti is not, as we say, making his mark. And there's nothing that Yayo Kusama is, is doing if she isn't making her mark. His practice, Boetti's, is compulsive but radically depersonalized, which means that the marking can be handed off to others. And I don't mean by this, by the way, merely that others can do the work, but that given the technique in question and the way it creates beauty, there's no rational ground to exclude others from doing it. Alighiero e Boetti is the site of an ever-expanding practice in which the limit of one hand just is the presence of the next, so that any exclusion, you might say, is shared universally shared by one and all. All are exiled together from ownership of the beauty that together they create. Or, since none is the creator, the beauty they witness. Let me put this point more concretely. The ballpoint pen drawings were made, in fact, by many hands. He didn't do them alone. They shouldn't be thought of for this reason as, for instance, abstract versions of, a, of the exquisite corpse game. Okay, you know, the favorite drawing game of surrealists. They can't be thought of as abstract exquisite corpses since, to begin with, everyone can see what everyone else has done. The whole way exquisite corpse works is you can't see what your predecessor did. Everyone can see what everyone else has done. And in any case, everyone does the same exact thing. Right? Nor are these collectively made works since there is no determinately nameable group of artists who made them together. In fact, given all marks we see are simple strokes of a ballpoint pen, there's no reason to think there are any artists at all involved in making these works. You don't go to art school to learn how to do this with a ballpoint pen. No reason to think there are any artists involved. And if we think of the title artist as a kind of ownership, who's that by? Then the idea that there's no artist here implies that there's instead a swarm of collaborators who transferred the ink from a hoard of pens to a hoard of pieces of paper. The ballpoint pen drawings are products of no one in particular. They were made, we need the word now, they were made anonymously. Which also means, of course, that Amonimo is eponymous. Who is the artist? The artist is Amonimo. <laughs> and possess, therefore, an expressive impersonality. The beauty emerges because the mess is owned by none and by all. 
We can, uh, we can see now, we can see how, we can now see how Alighiero Boetti provides answers to the first of the two questions OCHD made visible for us. What's the cost we bear for the development of the ability to see with the force of unreflective immediacy what has no value? And what must we leave behind to ascend to the shared categorical world in which an abundance of values becomes trash? The cost of learning to sort is the perception that no one may take possession of or take into protect protection what has become disgraced. That's the cost that has to be borne. We learn this by confronting the thing that is universally disvalued, that has passed, in, that has passed um, out of the esteem of all. The limit of my categories is not the presence of other values. That, I'm afraid, is cheap pluralism. The limit of my categories is what has no value. That's the mess we all make, and it's the perception that the hoarder can't bear. Compulsive hoarders paradoxically distraught, try to save it all because they can't bear that mess, that something would fall completely out of protection. What we must leave behind to ascend to the categorical world to let the mess emerge from the hoard is the belief, this is what we have to leave behind, that it's my responsibility to save what's been stripped of grace. It is no one's responsibility. And that is why in Algeria Boetti's drawings, what, it's, what has lost its harbor in me is taken up by anonymous others, by no one else. What has no value is a call to a social activity, not a call to a renewal of grace. This lets us bring into view a Boetian answer to the next question, is there any way to acknowledge and repair the injuries we inflict when we learn to forget our history of devaluation? For Boetti, the acknowledgement of the injuries, the limitlessness of additive beauty, is possible only within a practice in which no one is authorized to preserve the values. No one is authorized to preserve lost values. Boetti's practice is, we might say, a kind of atheism of art in which the toppling of the idol, the artist, opens the prospect of a beauty owned by no one, but not therefore an absence of beauty. The acknowledgement that the ideal of authoritative art, art that will save what we have damaged, the acknowledgement that this is a myth can be a source of devastation in roughly the same way as the atheistic experience of the mythical status of the gods can be a source of devastation. But I think Boetti sees that it's a devastation we must undergo in order to realize the task of art, which is to share the burden of the mess we make in a practice that can go on only impersonally. Um, Joseph Boyce, also keen to demolish the myth of the authoritative artist, famously announced, everyone is an artist. Related but different in consequential ways is what I think is Boetti's motto. No one is the artist. Not everyone is an artist, no one is the artist. Needs be the practice this gives, shapes to, shapes, gives shape to is one of beautiful impersonality in which the beauty is the expression of the general ownership of the mess. It's a practice owned by all or by none. Okay, not elicited, I'm sorry, I've gone on 10 minutes. I've not yet elicited an answer to the fourth and final question. What's the place of the messianic impulse in the world from which it's exiled? Um, I'll do so in a moment by means of a final reflection, it's only one more page, on a ballpoint pen drawing called the six senses. Um, but as I'll close with that reflection, let me first make good on the question I left hanging, why it is that art takes up the problem of exile from value. I think in Boetti's art we can see that just as compulsive hoarding is a disorder of ownership, so too is art, a disorder of ownership in his art. Um, put at such a high level of philosophical abstraction, my point of course ignores art's specific place among the many practices that constitute the totality of our social life. I'm not going to apologize for that since the consuming of our current social life by one form of value alone, the commodity form, 
which is at the same time the divestment of the very idea of a form of value, since the value of the commodity always flows, um, that this makes obsessive abstraction, what you might think of as philosophy run amok, one price we may pay, we may choose to pay, to catch some little glimpse of where we are. Another name, by the way, for radical abstraction from the totality of social life would be catastrophic historical dislocation. Maybe that's what we're experiencing now. Um, you might think here of, um, of Walter Benjamin's interpretation of Paul Clay's Angulus Novus. Those of you who've read the concept of history, the theses know this. Um, who has all of human history piled up before him as a heap of rubble. Um, despite Benjamin's own very moving defense of collecting in an essay called Unpacking My Library, his angel is in fact the angel of hoarding, not of collecting. Excessive abstraction is not, however, the price art pays to maintain its intelligibility as a practice. In the case of art, the price is excessive concreteness. This is why there's so much skepticism about discursive interpretation of art. In our current moment, excessive concreteness means becoming, frequently means becoming immediately political. Art is nothing if it's not political, right? It's got to locate a purpose. Um, but in Boetti, excessive concreteness comes out differently. He was an impresario of a community of impersonal perspectives. Beauty in his art is the vision of an achieved egalitarianism of makers who remain cooperatively yet indifferently bound to one another. Bound by project and not by affinity. The excessive concreteness of the art, a matter of the sharing of labor. Of course, that this remains only a promise is clear from the fact that the disorder of ownership keeps churning, for art is also a commodity. So to return to the final question, what's the place of the thinking self in the world of value from which it's exiled? The hoarder, recall, is sick from thinking too much. One might want to say, then, that the cure is less thinking. Lord knows our world is ready to offer us this counsel at every turn. But if the problem we're dealing with is our fate in a world of disowned value, thinking less evades the problem. It's not thinking less, but thinking of thinking differently. That's the way to go. So I'll close with a discussion of the six senses, um, which is a name, by the way, for reasons that are familiar now. It's the name for um, many of Boetti's works. I'm just showing you one from 1974 to 1975. It's a very long multi-panel piece covered edge to edge, top to bottom with pen strokes. It also makes use of the same name game as Dementicare il tempo perduto. Um, in six senses, the alphabet might need a, here's the detail. Yeah, the alphabet runs down the left side um, and functions as a coding mechanism for the apostrophes. And just it's worth saying, in Italian, apostrophes are not, as they are in English, used to mark possession, but, um, but to mark elision. Right, so um, just an example. Um, right, and when an article ends with the same letter as begins the noun that it binds, the duplication is excised and the excision is marked by an apostrophe. So the way you say the female friend is l'amica, the apostrophe is where the disappearing A was. So the six senses is about what is absent. This is essential in figuring out why there are six senses. The familiar five senses are encrypted in the first five panels. And I won't, go th won't point the, the apostrophes out. Vedere, to see, gustare, to taste, to touch, to hear, and to smell. The first five senses, the familiar five senses are in the first five panels. The last three panels are blank, as if held open for senses yet to be discovered. But the last apostrophized panel encrypts pensare, to think. Thinking is the sense for what is absent that opens up space for senses yet undiscovered. Of course, we don't ordinarily regard thinking as a sense. But what would it mean to think of thinking as the sense 
that preserves all that has otherwise gone unperceived, all the value that has passed by. To think of it, that is, as the sense for the disvalue that's been sorted out, for, in other words, the mess we've made. Thinking in this light would be intrinsically impersonal, an artistic projection of a community of hoarders. But for this reason, it cannot ever be an individual possession. That way, madness lies. Can't be an individual possession. And so I conclude with one of the last works Boetti did, his self-portrait, um, as his late sculptural self-portrait, which I think we can regard as his version of the thinker. Right? That's the right name for this. Perceiving all this on one's own would be a kind of hoarding that would overheat the brain. The thinking self is most in need of the capacity to believe in the mess, to believe that tutto, everything, is what anyone owns or no one. But for that, the thinker needs to have his head cooled down, which leads us to conclude with a question. Where is all that water coming from? Thank you. How do you want to do this? Do When you've talked too long, hands go up, but that's just people stretching from their naps. <laughs> Hello. Um, thank you. That's a that's a great question. Um, so, um, hoarding as an illness is it's an illness of consumer culture, right? Definitely an illness of consumer culture. Um, that you, you might think of it this way: that hoarding, which could just be saving up for a rainy day, um, in other words, a completely understandable and rational activity becomes almost impossible when every day an endless truckload of commodities rains down on your head, right? It's, it's, there's no end to the saving. Um, that being said, so I think it's a disease of consumer culture. That being said, the concept of hoarding is much older than that. In fact, the word hoard derives from uh, old English word, in English, derives from an old English word, which simply meant treasure, right? And, and we still hear this sometimes, right? To have your own hoard is to have a collection of the things you most treasure. Um, that in itself is not a kind of illness, but to see it merely as treasure, which I think we can't anymore, it has 
a different overtone, to see a justice treasure is to assume that most of the world is valueless and only a little treasure matters. So the concept predates the disease, but the disease, I think, is almost certainly a disease of consumer culture. Does that address your question? It very much does. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for asking it. I'm just going to ask it right here. Uh, okay. <laughs> I noticed you mentioned uh, the Messianic, Messianistic uh, uh, principle, and I was wondering if you could elaborate on how it uh, correlates to what you define as the um, radical way of the Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, <coughs> Okay, yeah, so the, the question was, um, I was asked to elaborate on the connection between what I was calling the messianic impulse and specifically, if understood where you're pushing me, the specifically radi radically egalitarian aspect of hoarding, yeah. Um, so let me back up and take a running start at this question, which is, thank you for asking it, it's kind of the driving question of the paper, and I'm both moved and unhappy that I didn't answer it. Um, the, the, the reason I, um, I have a longer um, joke, which I couldn't make anything more than sarcastic in time for today's talk, so I eliminated it, about the rapid response unit in the um, V&A. Because the reason that seems to me such an inappropriate name for that group is the rapid response unit in the hospital, which gets in gear when a patient's condition rapidly deteriorates. So it's a set of protocols to respond to a medical emergency. Um, it would be a kind of crime, an ethical crime, if a patient's condition started to deteriorate and the head of the rapid response unit said, not that one. Right, the, 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 the rapid response unit is supposed to respond indifferently, right? All that matters is the deterioration of the medical condition. And the minute they turn into collectors, now we're gonna save that one, let the other one go, they've ceased to be um, ethic, m medically ethical, right? So there's a kind of um, egalitarianism here. It's not yet radical egalitarianism, but it's a kind of egalitarianism which expresses itself in a kind of indifference to distinctions. Right? It's obviously not indifference to the condition before it. It's radical concern for the condition before it. But it's, it's indifference to the whole world of distinctions that, you know, makes one person more interesting than another, one person more attractive than another, but it's indifference to that. Um, and the reason I am taking on board your question is that the, the, the bit of the argument that I'm not satisfied with yet is turning that indifference into egalitarianism. But the reason I'm gonna stick with it, so this is my real answer to your question, I'm gonna stick with it, is here's a thought that I think is impossible. Egalitarian love is impossible. And I won't run through the million reasons I think it's impossible, um, but um, it, another name for egalitarian love is messianic love. Right. And so I can say about the hoarder that the hoarder, insofar as she perceives value in everything, is involved in, lives in a world of messianic love. That, I think, is madness. So then the question opens up, can I retrieve the egalitarianism from its mad form? And the only way to do that is to recognize that egalitarianism as an ethical and political principle requires indifference. That's a hard lesson, I think. But that's where the thought is going. Does that answer the question? Okay. Like authorship in like 
the like unskilled stroke of a pen um, and the collective, like collective authorship, uh, and then collective like no no authorship. Um, and I was wondering your about your thoughts on maybe like skills that are like art school skills, like skills that were like developed at home, um, and then use like a multiple um, authored or like multiple people working on a piece that is authored by one person. Um, and like maybe how that relates to like hoarding yeah. in like hoarding of an off like hoarding of authorship or like hoarding of Yeah, no, it's a super question. In fact, yesterday we were talking about um, Saul LeWitt, right, um, whose practice was um, many hands, one author. And um, I have to answer your question, by the way, by backing away from a strong version of my argument, which I realized as I was talking I didn't mean, which is that the kind of collective authorship I'm interested in is the only source of beauty. I don't mean that. Um, and um, the case of a practice like the wits, there is, um, in, in some cases, a very compelling kind of beauty, but it is strangely hoarded. And it's even possible that in the case of, a pra do you know Saul Lewitt's art? Where he set, right, sends out the instructions and one is obliged to follow those instructions. It's even possible that the beauty of a particular drawing by the wit is dependent on the hands of those who execute it. And in that sense, it's dependent on um, the non-artistic contribution of those who just follow rules, which is the opposite of what you do in an art school. Right? Just follow the rules. But then that's hoarded by the author. And so it, it's, it's a related kind of practice and it's not an aesthetic critique of it to say that I find it ethically suspect. And I can say it about the wit, this is why he's an interesting challenge, because I'm not saying anything he didn't know. Right, it's not like he was trying to get away with something, it wasn't a lie. Right? But this practice of, of, of projecting out and then gathering back together the results, it just seems to me ethically hinky. And, and I think Boetti was worried about this. I'll give you, if I can, if you don't mind, this is a slight digression. Here's one of the, uh, what was for a while very common critiques of Boetti. Um, he did um, not just the, the everything tapestries that I showed, but I think the works of his that were probably best known for a long time were the maps of the world that he did, where he would um, do drawings of a map, send it over to Afghanistan, and say, weave what you want, right? Here's the outline, weave what you want. And he was criticized for being a kind of um, artistic imperialist, exploiting the labor of, um, of the Afghan weavers. Complicated argument, I think the criticism is not just, but if the criticism were just, it would be a case like the LeWitt case, where he sends it out, the aesthetic completion of the work is the hands of others, and then it comes back and gets displayed as his work. And um, I think in, in his case, that would just, if he did that, it would, it would spoil his whole practice. And if he did do that, it did spoil his whole practice. But is that answering the question you're asking? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. And, and he does credit them. In fact, you know, that, that paragraph that I have in the paper, which concludes with, and art too is also a commodity, it's very weird for me to talk about him because um, he has been almost completely taken back up into the collector world, 
right? And he wasn't for a long time, but in the last five years, he's been taken up into the collector world. And it's very weird to see because when his stuff comes up for auction now, you can flip through that whole auction catalog, you're not gonna find the name of a weaver anywhere, right? There are people I'm sure who collect Boetti now who have the slightly crazy thought in their head, gee, that guy was a really good weaver. What art school did he learn to weave in? Because there's no trail left behind. That was not his practice, right? He used to go to Afghanistan twice a year, work with the weavers, credit the weavers. When work sold, I mean, he never, works never did sell for a lot of money, but when they sold, he shared the proceeds with, with those who made the, the art. It was a collaborative practice. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>